Chapter 24. Let them laugh. The secret garden was not the only one Tikken worked in. Round the cottage on the moor there was a piece of ground enclosed by a low wall of rough stones. Early in the morning and late in the fading twilight, and on all the days Colin and Mary did not see him, Dickon worked there planting or tending potatoes and cabbages, turnips or carrots and herbs for his mother. In the company of his creatures, he did wonders there and was never tired of doing them, it seemed. While he dug or weeded, he whistled or sang bits of Yorkshire moor, moor songs or talked to Soot or Captain or the brothers and sisters he had taught to help him. We'd never get on as comfortable as we do, Mrs Sowerby said, if it wasn't for Dickon's garden. Anything will grow for him. His taters and cabbages is twice the size of anyone else's and they've got flavour with them as nobody's has. When she found a moment to spare, she liked to go out and talk to him. After supper, there was still a long, clear twilight to work in, and that was her quiet time. She could sit upon the low, rough wall and look on and hear stories of the day. She loved this time. There were not only vegetables in this garden. Dickon had brought penny packages of flower seeds now and then and sown bright, sweet-scented things among gooseberry bushes and even cabbages, and he grew borders of mignonette and pinks and pansies and things, whose seeds he could save year after year, or whose roots would bloom each spring and spread in time into fine clumps. The low wall was one of the prettiest things in Yorkshire because he had tucked moorland, foxglove and ferns and rock cress and hedgerow flowers into every crevice until only here and there glimpses of the stones were to be seen. All a chap's got to do to make them thrive, mother, he would say, is to be friends with them for sure. They're just like the creatures. If they're thirsty, give them a drink and if they're hungry, give them a bit of food. They want to live the same as we do. If they had died, I should feel as if I'd been a bad lad and somehow treated them heartless. It was in these twilight hours that Mrs Sowerby heard all that had happened at Misselthwaite Manor. At first she was only told that Master Colin had taken a fancy to going out in the grounds with Miss Mary and that it was doing him good. But it was not long before it was agreed between the two children that Dickon's mother might come into the secret. Somehow it was not doubted that she was safe for sure. So one beautiful still evening, Dickon told the whole story, with all the thrilling details of the buried key and the robin and the grey haze which had seemed like deadness, and the secret Mistress Mary had planned never to reveal. The coming of Dickon, and how it had been told to him, the doubt of Mis Mr Colin, and the final drama of his introduction to the hidden domain, combined with the incident of Ben Weatherstaff's un angry face peering over the wall, and Mr Colin's sudden indignant strength, made Mrs Sowerby's nice-looking face cha quite change colour several times. "'My word!' she said. "'It was a good thing that little lass came to the manor. "'It's been the making of her and the saving of him, "'standing on his feet, "'and us all thinking he was a poor half-witted lad "'with not a straight bone in him.' "'She asked a great many questions, "'and her blue eyes were full of deep thinking. "'What did they make of it at the manor, "'him being so well and cheerful and never complaining?' "'she inquired. They don't know what to make of it, answered Dickon. Every day, as comes round, his face looks different. It's filling out and it doesn't look so sharp, and the waxy colour is going. But he's he has to do his bit of complaining, with a highly entertained grin. What for in Mercy's name? asked Mrs Sowerby. Dickon chuckled. He does it to keep from guessing what's happened. If the doctor knew he'd found out he could stand on his feet, he'd likely write and tell Mr Craven. Master Collins saving the secret to tell himself. He's going to practice his magic on his legs every day until his father comes back and then he's going to march into his room and show him he's as straight as other lads. But him and Miss Mary think it's best plan to do a bit of groaning and fretting now and then to throw him off the scent. Mrs Sowerby was laughing a low, comfortable laugh long before he'd finished his last sentence. Eh, hey, she said, that pair's enjoying themselves, I'll warrant. They'll get a good bit of play acting out of it and there's nothing children lacks as much as play acting. Let's hear what they do, Dickon lad. Dickon stopped weeding and sat up on his heels to tell her. His eyes were twinkling with fun. Master Colin is carried down to his chair every time he goes out, he explains, and he flies out at John the footman for not carrying him careful enough. He makes himself as helpless looking as he can and never lifts his head until we're out of sight of the house. And he grunts and frets a good bit when he's been settled into his chair. Him and Miss Mary both got to enjoying it, and when he groans and complains she'll say... Poor Colin, does it hurt you so much? Are you so weak as that, poor Colin? But the trouble is that sometimes they can scarce keep themselves from bursting out laughing. 
When we get safe into the garden, they laugh until there's no breath to laugh with. And they have to stuff their faces into Mr. Collins' cushions to keep the gardeners from hearing, if any of them's about. The more they laugh, the better for them, said Mrs. Sowerby, still laughing herself. Good healthy child laughing, better pills than better than pills any day of the year. That, that pair will plump up for sure. They are plumping up, said Dickon. They're that hungry they don't know how to get enough to eat without making talk. Master Collins says if he keeps sending for more food, they won't believe he's an invalid at all. Miss Mary said she'll let him eat her share, but he says that if she goes hungry, then she'll get thin and they, might, they, might, they mightn't get fat at once. Mrs. Sowerby laughed so heartily at the revelation of this difficulty that she quite rocked backward and forward in her blue cloak, and Dickon laughed with her. "'I'll tell thee what, lad,' said Mrs. Sowerby, when she could speak. "'I've thought of a way to help em. "'When thou goes to them in the mornings, thou shalt take a pail of good new milk, "'and I'll bake them a crusty cottage loaf with some buns with currants in em, "'same as you children like. "'Nothing's as good as fresh milk and bread. "'Then they could take the edge of their hunger while they were in the garden, "'and the fine food they get indoors will put, polish off the corners.' "'Eh, hey, mother,' said Dickon admiringly, what a wonder that! That always is a way out of things. That was quite an a pother yesterday. They didn't see how they was to manage without ordering up more food. They felt that empty inside. They're two young uns growing fast, and health's coming back to both of them. Children like that feels like young wolves, and food's flesh and blood to them, said Miss Salby. Then she smiled Dickon's own curving smile. Eh, but they're enjoying themselves for sure, she said. She was quite right. The comfortable, wonderful mother creature, and she had never been more so than when she had said their play-acting would be their joy. Colin and Mary found it one of the most thrilling sources of entertainment. The idea of protecting themselves from suspicion had been unconsciously suggested to them first by the puzzled nurse and then by Dr Craven himself. "'Your appetite is improving very much, Master Colin,' the nurse had said one day. "'You used to eat nothing, and so many things disagreed with you.' "'Nothing disagrees with me now,' replied Colin, and then, seeing the nurse look at him curiously, he suddenly remembered that perhaps he ought not to appear too well just yet. "'At least, things don't so often disagree with me. It's the fresh air.' "'Perhaps it is,' said the nurse, still looking at him with a mystified expression. "'But I must talk to Dr Craven about it.' "'How she stared at you,' said Mary, when she went away. "'As if she thought there must be something to find out.' "'I won't have her finding out things,' said Colin. "'No one must begin to know, know anything just yet.' "'When Dr Craven came that morning, he seemed puzzled too. "'He asked a number of questions to Colin's great annoyance. "'You stay out in the garden a great deal,' he suggested. "'Where do you go?' "'Colin put on his favourite air of dignified indifference to opinion. "'I will not let anyone know where I go,' he answered. "'I go to a place I like.' Everyone has orders to keep out of the way. I won't be watched and stared at. You know that. You seem to be out all day, but I do I do think it has done you harm. I do not think it has. The nurse says that you eat much more than you'd ever done before. Perhaps, said Colin, prompted by a sudden inspiration, perhaps it's an unnatural appetite. I do not think so, as your food seems to agree with you, said Dr Craven. You are gaining flesh rapidly and your colour is better. Perhaps, perhaps I am bloated and feverish, said Colin, assuming a discouraging air of gloom. People who are not going to live are often different. Dr Craven shook his head. He was holding Colin's wrist and he pushed up his sleeve and felt his arm. You are not feverish, he said thoughtfully, and such flesh as you have gained is healthy. If we can keep this up, my boy, we need not talk of dying. Your father will be very happy to hear of this remarkable improvement. I won't have him told, Colin broke forth fiercely. It will only disappoint him if I get worse again, and I may get worse this very night. I might have a raging fever. I feel as if I might be beginning to have one now. I won't have letters written to my father. I won't. I won't. You are making me angry. Then you knew that it's bad for me. I feel hot already. I hate being written about and hate being talked over as much as I hate being stared at. Hush, my boy, Dr Craven soothed him. Nothing shall be written without your permission. You are too sensitive about things. You must not undo the good which has been done. 
He said no more about writing to Mr Craven, and when he saw the nurse, he privately warned her that such a possibility must not be mentioned to the patient. The boy is extraordinarily better, he said. His advance seemed almost abnormal, but of course he is doing now of his own free will what we could not make him do before. Still, he excites himself very easily and nothing must be said to irritate him. Mary and Colin were much alarmed and talked together anxiously. From this time dated their plan of play-acting. I may be obliged to have a tantrum, said Colin regretfully. I don't want to have one and I'm not miserable enough now to work myself into a big one. Perhaps I couldn't have one at all. That lump doesn't come in my throat now and I keep thinking of nice things instead of horrible ones. But if they talk about writing to my father, I shall have to do something. He made up his mind to eat less, but unfortunately it was not possible to carry out this brilliant idea when he wakened each morning with an amazing appetite and the table near his sofa was set with a breakfast of homemade bread and fresh butter, snow white eggs, raspberry jam and clotted cream. Mary always breakfasted with him and when they found themselves at the table, particularly if there were de delicate slices of sizzling ham sending forth tempting odours from under a hot silver cover, they would look into each other's eyes in desperation. I think we shall have to eat it all this morning, Mary, Colin ended up saying always. We can send some away of the lunch and a, and a great deal of, of the dinner. But they never found they could send away anything, and the highly polished condition of the empty plates returned to the pantry awakened much comment. I do wish, Colin would say also, I do wish the slices of ham were thicker and one muffin each is not enough for anyone. It is enough for a person who is going to die answered Mary when she first heard this, but it's not enough for a person who is going to live. I sometimes feel as if I could eat three when those nice, fresh, healthy and gorse smells from the moor come pouring in at the open window. The morning that Dickon, after they had been enjoying themselves in the garden for about two hours, went behind a big rose bush and brought forth two tin pails that revealed and revealed that one was full of rich new milk with cream on the top of it, and the other held cottage-made currant buns folded in a clean blue and white napkin, buns so carefully tucked in that they were still hot, there was a riot of surprised joyfulness. What a wonderful thing to, for Mrs Sowerby to think of! What a kind, clever woman she must be! How good the buns were, and what delicious fresh milk! Magic is in her, just as it is in Dickon! said Colin. It makes her think of ways to do things, nice things. She is a magic person. Tell her we're grateful, Dickon, extremely grateful. He was given to using rather grown-up phrases at, time. at times. He enjoyed them. He liked this so much that he improved upon it. Tell her that she has been most bounteous and our gratitude is extreme. And then, forgetting his grandeur, he fell to and stuffed himself with with buns and drank milk out of the pail in copious draughts of the manner of any hungry little boy who had been taking unusual exercise and breathing in moorland air and whose breakfast was more than two hours behind him. This was the beginning of many agreeable incidents of the same kind. They actually awoke to the fact that as Miss Sowerby had 14 people to provide food for, she might not have enough to satisfy two extra appetites every day, so they asked her to let them send some of their shillings to buy things. Dickon made the stimulating discovery that in the wood in the park outside the garden where Mary had first found him piping to the wild creatures, there was a deep little hollow where you could build a sort of tiny oven with stones and roast potatoes and eggs in it. Roasted eggs were a previously unknown luxury, and very hot potatoes with salt and fresh butter in them were fit for a woodland king, besides being deliciously satisfying. You could buy both potatoes and eggs and eat as many as you liked without feeling as if you were taking food out of the mouth of fourteen people. Every beautiful morning the magic was worked by the mystic circle under the plum tree which provided a canopy of thickening green leaves after its brief blossom time was ended. After the ceremony Colin always took his walking exercise and throughout the day he exercised his newly found power at intervals. Each day he grew stronger and could walk more steadily and cover more ground and each day his belief in the magic grew stronger as well it might he tried one experiment after another, and he felt himself gaining strength, and it was Dickon who showed him the best things of all. Yesterday, he said one morning after an absent, I went to Thwaite for mother, and near the Blue Cow Inn I seed Bob Howarth. He's the strongest chap on the moor. He's the champion wrestler, and he can jump higher than any chap and throw a hammer further. 
He's gone all the way to Scotland for the sports for some years. He's known me ever since I was little, and he's a friendly sort, and I asked him some questions. The gentry called him an athlete, and I thought of thee, Master Cullen, and I said, How did that make their muscles stick out that way, Bob? Did that do anything extra to make themselves so strong? And he said, Well, yes, lad, I did. A strong man in a show that came to Thwaite once showed me how to exercise my arms and legs and every muscle in my body. And I said, Could a delicate chap make himself stronger with them, Bob? And he laughed and he says, Ah, that a delicate chap? And I said, no, but I know as a young gentleman that's getting well off a long illness and I wish I'd known some tricks to tell him about. I didn't say no names and he didn't ask none. He's friendly, same as I said. And he stood up and showed me good-natured like and I imitated what he did until I knowed it by heart. Colin had been listening excitedly. Can you show me? He cried. Will you? Aye, to be sure. Dickon answered, getting up. But he said them and do and gentle at first and be careful not to tire thyself. Rest in between times and take deep breaths and don't overdo. I'll be careful, said Colin. Show me, show me. Dickon, you are the most magic boy in the world. Dickon stood up on the grass and slowly went through a carefully practical but simple series of muscle exercises. Colin watched them with widening eyes. He could do a few while he was sitting down. Presently he did a few gently while he stood upon his already steady feet. Mary began to do them also. Soot, who was watching the performance, became much disturbed and left his branch and hopped about restlessly because he could not do them too. From that time the exercises were part of the day's duty, as much as the magic was. It became possible for both Colin and Mary to do more of them each time they tried, and such appetites were the results that, but for the basket dis Dickon put down behind the bush each morning, when he arrived they would have been lost. But the little oven in the hollow and Mrs Sowerby's bounties were so satisfying that Mrs Medlock and the nurse and Dr Craven became mystified again. You can trifle with your breakfast and seem to disdain your dinner if you are full to the brim with roasted eggs and potatoes and richly frothed new milk and oat cakes and buns and healthier honey and clotted cream. They are eating next to nothing, said the nurse. They'll die of starvation if they can't be persuaded to take some nourishment and yet see how they look. Look, exclaimed Mrs Medlock indignantly. Eh, hey, I'm mothered to death with them. They're a pair of young Satans, burst in their jackets one day and the next, next turning up their noses at the best meals cook can tempt them with. Not a mouthful of that young, lovely young fowl and bread sauce did they take a fork to yesterday. And the fair woman fair invented a pudding, a pudding for them and back it sent. She almost cried. She'll, she's afraid she'll be blamed if they starve themselves into their graves. Dr Craven came and looked at Colin long and carefully. He wore an extremely worried expression when the nurse talked with him and showed him the almost untouched tray of breakfast she had saved for him to look at. But it was he was even more worried when he sat down by Colin's sofa and examined him. He had been called to London on business and had not seen the boy for nearly two weeks. When young things begin to gain health, they gain it rapidly. The waxen tinge had left Colin's skin and a warm rose showed through it. His beautiful eyes were clear and the hollows under them and in his cheeks and his temples had filled out. His once dark, heavy locks had begun to look as if they sprang healthily from his forehead and, his, and were soft and warm with life. His lips were fuller and of a normal colour. In fact, as an imitation of a boy who was a confirmed invalid, he was a disgraceful sight. Dr Craven held his chin in his hand and thought him over. I'm sorry to hear that you do not eat anything, he said. That will not do. You will lose all you have gained, and you have gained amazingly. You ate so well a short time ago. I told you it was unnatural appetite, answered Colin. Mary was sitting on her stool nearby, and she suddenly made a very queer sound, which she tried so violently to repress that she ended up almost choking. What is the matter? said Dr Craven, turning to look at her. Mary became quite severe in her manner. It was something between a sneeze and a cough she replied with reproachful dignity, and, I, and it got into my throat. But, she said afterward to Colin, I couldn't stop myself. It just burst out because all at once I couldn't help remembering that L big last potato you ate and the way your mouth stretched when you bit through that thick, lovely crust with jam and clotted cream on it. Is there any way in which those children can get food secretly? Dr Craven inquired of Mrs Medlock. 
There's nowhere unless they dig it out of the earth or pick it off the trees, Mrs. Medlock answered. They stay out in the grounds all day and see no one but each other. And if they want anything different to eat from what's sent up to them, they'd only need ask. Well, said Dr. Craven, so long as going without food agrees with them, we need not deserve ourselves. The boy is a new creature. So is the girl, said Mrs. Medlock. She's begun to be downright pretty since she's filled out and lost her ugly, sour little look. Her hair's grown thick and healthy looking, and she's got a bright colour. The glommest, ill-natured little thing she used to be, and now her and Master Colin laugh together like a pair of crazy young ones. Perhaps they're growing fat on that. Perhaps they are, said Dr. Craven. Let them laugh.